Dr. Posey, who's going to talk to us um, <laughs> um, chronic foot drop. So uh, Lou, take on over. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those that have not had the chance to meet yet, my name is Lou Posey. I'm one of our PGY2 residents. Today, I'd like to discuss where we are at currently with treatment options for chronic foot drop. My only significant disclosure is that I am active duty Air Force. So I'm required to state that this presentation today only reflects my own views and understanding of the topic and not necessarily those of the US Air Force, Department of Defense or the US government. Though I can say the Air Force does have the most commander in chief trophies. While I cannot cover all relevant interesting topics such as the acute treatment and various etiologies of foot drop, we will start out reviewing why this topic is important with some case examples. And then we can discuss pertinent anatomy and review the history of treatment options for chronic foot drop. And then we'll get into the current indications and technical pearls of various surgical procedures with a subsequent focus on the outcomes in the literature. And then we'll wrap up our case examples. So why should we all be interested in this topic? Well, I think we can all agree that this young 32 year old patient has a problem. She has spastic equinus contractures after a brain tumor was successfully removed and can no longer ambulate. And this provides really a great multidisciplinary overlap for our MSKI and how we can work together to improve lives. Another good case example is this middle-aged man who hurt his knee while he was playing basketball with his son. He had a successful ACL surgery but had a persistent foot drop and had been in an AFO brace for over a year. He had also tried multiple rounds of PT and nerve stimulators with little to no improvement. And at this point, he really just wanted to get out of his brace and be more comfortable on the golf course again. On exam, he had the classic steppage gait pattern, no tibialis anterior function, but pretty reasonable perineal and tibialis posterior strength and function. He was also numb over the dorsum of his foot as drawn in the figure. So we can all agree that there are various causes of foot drop or aquinas deformity. And we're really, regardless of the etiology or type, they really can impact lives. And now we can dive into different ways to help these two people out. So with that said, let's just discuss some of the important anatomy for the topic. The common perineal nerve is the most likely culprit for the pathology. Obviously, there can be more proximal injuries as shown in our case examples. But that nerve is derived from the L4 to S2 nerve roots as part of the sciatic nerve. And in the thigh, the perineal division of the sciatic nerve is located in the posterior and lateral portion of the nerve which is what predisposes it to stretch or injury during exposures for hip arthroplasty, for example. In the upper popliteal fossa, the static nerve divides into the common perineal and tibial nerve, which is what we recall that is the anterior compartment musculature that we typically lose in cases of foot drop due to its innervation by the deep perineal nerve. And we usually end up relying on the posterior compartment innervated by the tibial nerve for later surgical options. So we have historically treated foot drop based on acuity. And although the focus of this talk is gonna be on chronic foot drop, I'll just briefly mention some of the acute treatment options before we get into chronic treatment. Initial observation is always warranted, even for complete injuries. As this review paper shows, nearly 40% of patients with complete foot drop after knee dislocation make a functional recovery. And almost all make a full recovery with incomplete injuries. But if it's been about three to six months and there's been no improvement on EMG or nerve conduction studies, it is typically time to consider decompression and neurolysis, which can be carried down to the bifurcation of the common perineal nerve into the superficial and deep perineal branches within the peroneus longus muscle fibers. And after this neurolysis and decompression alone, about 88% end up having recovery of useful function. And then in the aggressive lesions, such as as a schwannoma or neurofibroma, referral to an orthopedic oncologist would then be warranted. And then a separate mechanism, such as a laceration, would suggest a complete motor deficit and primary repair within 72 hours is then recommended. But later management with sural nerve graft or even nerve conduits has also been described for defects up to six centimeters with reasonable outcomes so long as they're performed within six months from the time of injury. But what about the patient's over a year out from injury. That's really our main focus for today. And historically, that's really boiled down into non-surgical and surgical options. To first address the supportive options available on surgical route, we focus on the use of AFOs and physical therapy, which can include interventions such as muscle stimulators to prevent atrophy of the anterior compartment, 
And AFOs really come in several flavors, such as spring-loaded, solid, or articulating AFOs, and even custom ones with variable cadence. This was a great review of the dynamic function of custom AFOs, and 30 patients utilizing carbon fiber the custom AFOs were studied in this paper, and 17 of the patients actually had foot drop. They saw great improvements in functional scores with dynamic testing after undergoing the return to run clinical pathway, which is an intense multidisciplinary rehabilitative program with PT, OT, orthotists, and others. And this is a pretty reasonable option for patients, especially in the military, that may have higher expectations or goals. However, you really have to first ask about the patient's expectations. I mean, my interpretation of this paper is that this pathway works really well for the higher demand patients, more so than the older patient who just wants to get out of their brace. And also cannot be understated the amount of financial support this would cost from a multidisciplinary rehab standpoint. And that's really not even getting into the potential cost of the brace or future braces and getting insurance approval on the civilian side. So now let's jump to the surgical treatment options for chronic drop foot, which is limited to various tendon transfers and a salvage arthrodesis past the one year mark based on available literature. And again, I think this rests on patient expectations as well as their specific situation. The biopsychosocial model and approach to shared decision-making cannot be emphasized enough before pursuing surgery. And first let's discuss some of the pearls and history behind tendon transfers. Right up front, the ultimate goal is really to get a plantigrade foot that is neutral and hopefully no longer requiring a brace. But you have to first order the HMP and understand the primary cause or where the lesion is located driving pathology, as well as a thorough exam to know what sort of transfers are viable from a motor and range of motion standpoint. Mayer had five fundamental tenets for these tendon transfers. The first is restoration of the anatomic relationship between a tendon and its sheath followed by tendon routing through tissue that allows for proper gliding, and then recreating the anatomic tendon insertion with restoration of the normal tendon tension, followed by establishing proper line of tendon pull. And the concept of establishing proper line or vector of tendon pull is really important because if you think about it, the function of a tendon is determined by its position relative to the joint under consideration. So tendons that run posterior and medial to the subtalar joint function as plantar flexors and inverters, respectively. Meanwhile, a tendon running anterior to the ankle and lateral to the subtalar joint creates a dorsiflexion and eversion moment arm. And these muscular units create antagonistic forces to balance the foot. For example, your posterior tibialis tendon and peroneus tertius tendons directly counterbalance each other. So complete loss of one component of this force couple leads to deformity dictated by its antagonist. And obviously the muscular forces at a baseline are unequal. Silver and colleagues in their biomechanical studies showed that plantar flexors tend to have about seven times the relative strength units compared to the dorsiflexors. And similar numbers were also seen for inverters having about six times the relative strength of everters. Which should help explain why our first patient from our case examples developed an equino bears deformity. After her central nervous system injury, there was relative overpool by flexors and inverters of the ankle and hind foot, respectively. To restore ankle dorsiflexion, the historically classic tendon transfer is the posterior tibialis tendon transfer to the dorsum of the midfoot, which is typically to the lateral cuneiform. And as we know now, the posterior tibialis tendon is the workhorse of deformity correction. Some may even call it the Hulk. And it was first described by Mayer in 1937, but ultimate credit for the first one performed was in 1933 by Ober. However, this technique involved transfer of the tendon subcutaneously around the medial aspect of the tibia to the dorsum of the foot. And recalling Mayer's tenets on the importance of vector and inline pull, Watkins receives credit for the biomechanical improvement in dorsiflexion by being the first to describe the transfer through the interosseous membrane. Current technique involves four incisions as a modification to the Watkins technique. The first incision is made to harvest the tibialis posterior tendon at the medial foot between the tail of the navicular joint and medial cuneiform. A key here is really taking a long periosteal flap with the tendon of the navicular for maximizing length. And then a second incision is made at the posterior calf of the musculotendinous junction of the tibialis posterior and the distal tendon periosteal flap is delivered through this incision. And then a third incision is made anterior to the distal fibula to make a two centimeter space in the interosseous membrane for which to pass that tendon flap through. 
And a big key here is to identify and protect the superficial perineal nerve uh, within this third incision and exposure. And then now with the tibialis posterior tendon in the anterior compartment at a fourth and final incision is made over the dorsum of the foot at the lateral cuneiform. And the tendon is passed subcutaneously from the third to the fourth and secured to the bone tunnel either with an interference screw or a suture bud. And in this cadaveric biomechanical study, Go and company determined that the tibialis posterior tendon transfer to the lateral cuneiform provides the most balanced and neutral ankle dorsiflexion moment. But some of the problems with this procedure can come down to stretching out of the tendon over time or actually not having enough length initially for the transfer. This can sometimes be overcome by a gastroc or Achilles tendon lengthening procedure to achieve more passive dorsiflexion. And that's the case anyways, that that's already planned ahead of time for taking the patient to the OR. Nonetheless, other techniques have also been described where the tibialis posterior tendon is passed anterior to the interosseous membrane and a tenodesis of it to the extensor tendons proximal to the ankle joint is performed. And in this paper describing it, 10 of 11 patients were able to discontinue their AFO brace, um, but they did notably have one failed tendon transfer. And there have also been reports for the development of flat foot deformity following an isolated tibialis posterior transfer. And many presume this to be due to the unopposed eversion and pull of that tibialis posterior tendon after the transfer. Thus, assuming it is functional, again, for the patient specifically, um, an FDL transfer to the navicular has also been described in conjunction with that aforementioned tibialis posterior transfer to the cuneiforms to help avoid this imbalance. Now switching gear slightly to a different tendon transfer, for patients with more proximal neurologic injury or deformity, a bridal procedure could be considered. And this was first described by McCall and is really a tritendon anastomosis between your tibialis anterior, tibialis posterior, and peroneus longus. Even in a completely flaccid foot, this procedure would function to block plantar flexion. And if you start out with the normal steps we described earlier for a tibialis posterior transfer, once the tendon is on the anterior side of the interosseous membrane, it is actually passed through a longitudinal split in your tibialis anterior tendon. And then through a separate posterior lateral incision, the peroneus longus tendon is cut about five centimeters proximal to the fibula. And afterwards, that proximal portion of your peroneus longus tendon is sewn to peroneus brevis. And the distal portion of peroneus longus is actually pulled out from underneath the superior and inferior retinaculum and put into the small incision made directly along the lateral hind foot over where peroneus longus typically traverses the cuboid. It can then be rerouted subcutaneously into the anterior based incision and sewn into tibialis uh, posterior and anterior for the anastomosis. And this technique was actually modified by Rodriguez and colleagues to have tibialis posterior enter a bone tunnel in the middle cuneiform to give a little more biomechanical advantage for dorsiflexion. And they were able to show, you know, patients that were brace free for nearly seven years of follow up, and about half of those patients actually had active dorsiflexion of 10 degrees. Getting into outcomes, a more study out of St. Louis showed excellent outcomes for patients undergoing a bridal for foot drop. The average age was about 40 years old of note, but all reported that they would go through with the surgery again and all were brace free at their follow up appointment. So, getting back to our case reviews, for our gentleman who had an AFO for over a year after his knee injury, he underwent an isolated tibialis posterior tendon transfer to the middle cuneus as his deficit was truly isolated to just the anterior compartment. Only enough and unfortunate for the patient, he had progressive collapse of his arch postoperatively and later ended up developing a painful pronation deformity through his hind foot, which we discussed earlier was one of the potential risks of an isolated tibialis posterior transfer. He was ultimately taken back to the OR for a talonavicular fusion to correct his deformity. And now a few years out, he's actually back to playing golf and pretty happy with his outcome with active dorsiflexion and he's also brace free at this point. And then our 32 year old patient recovering from her brain tumor resection, she was taken to the OR and underwent a tibialis anterior transfer on the right and actually a tibialis posterior transfer on the left as well as a pretty aggressive gastroc release due to her contractures. She is no longer wheelchair bound, which is a huge improvement. She does still use her AFO on the left, as you can see in the images, but she's now plantar grade and six months out from her surgery. 
So in summary, chronic drop foot is a tough challenge, but there are options available. The biggest part of the decision-making process involves discuss, discussing expectations and discussing their goals and specific biopsychosocial characteristics. And then on a separate note, I highly recommend The Boys in the Boat if you're interested in a good read. It's an amazing history lesson that dives into the U.S. rowing team uh, that won the 1936 Berlin Olympics. It really highlights where embracing challenges can be a lot of fun when you have a good team. Speaking of which, I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Jones and Dr. Irwin for their support for this presentation and definitely my class for being an unending source of fun and motivation this year. Here are my references. And I'll pause now for any questions or comments. Thanks a lot for your time. Lou, that was a, a fantastic talk. And um, I'll be anxious to hear what our foot and ankle and sports colleagues on the call have to say about how they think the best way to manage this is. Um, I, I'm curious because that's, that's kind of another topic here that, um, sure. you know, timing of when to do the poster tip. Some people advocate for doing it earlier yeah. uh, with, you know, uh, a exploration of the nerve, et cetera. Yeah, no, the, um, you know, we, we reviewed this in 13 in a JIS article that I wrote with Fraser Leversage and the algorithm that we were using then, which may have been updated in the 16 article that, that um, Lou was reporting was that we'd wait three months and if there wasn't any return, we'd get an EMG at that time. And um, if the EMG didn't show any, any functioning, we'd move ahead um, without delay. Um, obviously, this is a prolonged process. Most of these people have been through ACL, PCL, posterior lateral corner reconstructions and you know, that they've already got a year recovery. So adding on to that is, is significant for, particularly for a young athlete. So we were trying to do them as close after that EMG as we could, if it didn't show any recovery of the nerve, which most of the time it didn't, if they didn't have it to start with. Um, the, the second player um, was actually done acutely um, because he really had, um, his central pivot, interestingly enough, was intact. And so we just did a posterior lateral corner on him. And at that same setting, we actually went ahead and did the tendon transfer. Um, because he, um, he had a dense palsy and, um, and didn't really have, we thought the prognosis was very poor. Um, one of the articles that I'd be interested in your comment on was that um, not only are, are folks recommending acute um, intervention for the tendons, but also doing a nerve repair at the same setting. And um, I, I'm not sure that's a big surgery, um, but um, there is some evidence that maybe that's an even better approach. So interested in your comment on that. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, I've worked with some people who, who advocated for that. I think the hard part is, is recognizing that. And a lot of times it's, it's a hard call. I, I gave a grand rounds recently on a similar topic um, back at Beaumont. And, you know, it's kind of like, when do you make the call to do a tendon transfer early? When do you make the call to do the, the nerve, you know, release? And, and sometimes with our sports colleagues, I feel like it's great that you know this, but sometimes you know, you just kind of let it, let it ride and, and see what happens. But then the muscle, the anterior compartment muscle can die. And that's the idea, I think, with early posterior tip tendon transfer, you continue to activate the anterior compartment. If you release the nerve or, or repair the nerve, then it maybe can, you know, still activate that anterior compartment. So I think it's an interesting concept, but I, I can't say I know what the right answer is at this point. Hey, this is uh, Carol. I think, um, yeah, honestly, the, the conversation that that we have far more often than the the early acute injuries is is the chronic situation, and it just I think it surprises all of us how often we see patients that have been told by um, other providers that there's there's no really viable treatment for their foot drop, and that they're um, committed to a brace for the rest of their life, and Young or old, I know Lou had mentioned there may be some differences in age in terms of how they tolerate their brace, but young or old, honestly, the braces are, are very, very uh, cumbersome and fairly poorly accepted. So uh, it's, it's always, um, I think the patients are incredibly um, excited about and, and receptive to the idea of a tendon transfer just so they can have a sort of brace-free life. And so most of the ones we see, honestly, are um, it's in many cases years out from whether it's a spine surgery or um, a lower extremity injury. And whether you do a posterior tip transfer isolated or do the bridal transfer that Lou talked about is a, is a long discussion probably beyond the uh, sort of purvey this, this morning. But uh, it's interesting at Duke, they do the isolated posterior tip 
fairly routinely. And then here at Charlotte, we do the bridal, um, I'd say, as our go-to. And the bridal does, I think, balances the foot a lot better. Uh, the case that Lou showed is actually a friend of mine who had his knee dislocated and then had an isolated posterior tip transfer and ended up getting a pretty bad flat foot after that. And then um, that was done by one of my partners. And I ended up doing an isolated tendon of Victor fusion to address his flat foot. So uh, I think the bridal, although you can still have that problem with the bridal, I think the bridal better balances the foot and it's a far more powerful uh, tendon transfer. And that's something that I learned. I, I've not even seen it before. I got to throw it out. That's something I learned from, from uh, Bob and Hodges uh, years ago. So um, great talk, Lou. And I, I think the take home message is patients don't need to be limited to a brace the rest of their life. And even if they don't have a functioning posterior tip tendon, it's still a pretty effective tendinitis effect. So it's a great operation, even if you have weak tendons that you're transferring. So um, thank you and appreciate the talk, Lou. <clears throat> Lou, it's an interesting uh, topic. I, uh, on being on the tumor service, I've had the uh, unique opportunity of uh, carefully identifying the uh, common perineal nerve and then resecting it. Um, so those uh, are pretty definitively going to have a, a foot drop. And, and those are interesting because you can have a conversation ahead of time about what to do with it. And I think that we've looked at surgical options. Um, we've looked at nerve transfer options. But we've also uh, used bracing, and I've have a, I have a couple patients who have actually done incredibly well uh, in braces. I wonder if uh, Dr. Shu could uh, comment a little bit on that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Josh. We act, we translated the the bracing pathway that we developed in the military to here, as people know, and it's been up and running for about seven years now. What we've worked on the past five years is scaling it down to actually uh, address some of the challenges that uh, Dr. Posey mentioned, cost of the brace and, uh, and PT, et cetera. Um, the update on cost of the brace, um, there's, still no, there's still no solution for people that are uninsured. Um, of course, there's not a surgical solution for those people either. Um, and so we, we don't have a solution for that, but for those people, even we've even successfully gotten multiple braces in people with South Carolina Medicaid and for those of you on this, uh, this call know that that's not the greatest payer and tends to refuse a lot of uh, medical interventions. And, and we've been able to do that, work comp, um, you, you, you know, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, and so we've scaled down the, the price of that. And I have no disclosures associated with it um, so that people can basically just, you can write a prescription and, and they can get it. Um, and then the research team here um, really took the effort to lean forward and, and uh, create a home-based therapy program as well. And so the patients don't have to go through the intensive in-person rehabilitation. Um, Andrew Waller is going to lead an evaluation of, of uh, that work. Um, and hopefully we'll presenting, be presenting some of those outcomes at Research Day this year as we roll out paper. Lou, did you find anything in your review about, um, uh, you know, looking at the choices of what to do here? Because, you know, I think I've had conversations with Glenn, I know, in the past about, you know, if you do a nerve transfer early and it doesn't work, did you take it away from the power you might have had before? If you do a tendon transfer first and then, I mean, that the order of, of those, do you hurt later options? Obviously, a brace isn't probably going to hurt a later surgical option necessarily, but do either of these surgical options or surgical sort of pathways, um, you know, hurt it if, if option one doesn't work? Any um, discussion of that anywhere that you read about? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Patton. Thanks, everyone, for their additions to my talk and kind of clarifications. I think it kind of goes back to what Dr. Mormon mentioned around the three-month mark, and that's why I kind of focus my talk on the chronic portion to kind of avoid <laughs> that uh, okay. ambiguity past a year. You don't really have to worry about it at that point. Like Dr. Irwin said, a lot of the anterior compartment may be dead at that point and not functioning. Read about several anecdotal cases where, you know, if they operated a little too early with the tendon transfer, but then had some nerve recovery down the road, if you had some like out of phase balance with the foot, but I didn't find any discrete algorithm that said, you know, if you do the tendon transfer and kind of what Dr. Irwin also mentioned and is an interesting thought to also do the nerve exploration as well as the tendon transfer at the same time. I 
don't have a definitive answer for you. I think that's why there's still a lot of ongoing controversy over it. Yeah, Josh, I can answer from the uh, nerve transfer side. I don't think the nerve transfer burns any bridges at all, just because we're currently doing a double fascicular nerve transfer early for these. And a lot, usually we're using like toe flexors, uh, branches to toe flexors. Occasionally we've used branch, a single branch to gastroc or soleus. Um, but none of those uh, patients have lost the ability to get late tendon transfers if they didn't work. And what we found, we do the nerve transfers early. We've got about a dozen of these now. It's not as good. Some of the nerve transfers we do are like 85, 90%. These haven't been that. They've been about 50%. But the nice thing is, to your point, done acutely, you don't burn any bridges. And most of the time, um, we've been doing them on kind of young, healthy patients. And we've been... I think that that absolute best indication is when at the time of their knee reconstruction for the knee dislocation patients, if they know the nerves out immediately, then you really lose nothing. In my eyes, you should go ahead and just do the nerve transfer early then. And just like T said, they were waiting three months at Duke. We've been doing uh, a minimum of four to five months with two negative EMGs for any signs of polyphasics for recovery. And if that's the case, and it's a younger, healthy patient, then we've moved ahead with nerve transfers. If they got additional comorbidities or things that we worry about or age, smoking, uh, many of those things, then a lot of times we've just deferred those straight over to foot and ankle for tendon transfers. Well, great discussion. Um, appreciate everybody's uh, interaction uh, as uh, Louis.